So, we've been in this series of messages on the call and how God calls us, how we respond. Each one's been a little bit different, right? As we look at the different characters in the, in the Bible. And uh, last week, I was having lunch with uh, one of our members, Pam Prosky, and we were talking about the series. And she said, you know, the one I miss, I like Nehemiah because it's so practical. It says, bam, bam, bam. And I said, well, that's funny because I'm preaching on it next week. <laughs> but then when I was preparing, I thought, it's not that bam, 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 it's, 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 but it's a pretty interesting story. And uh, this is one situation that's a little bit different than the others we've looked at. And the others we've had, you know, God says to Abraham, pack up and go and leave, or, or burning bush and Moses, you're to go and do that. And God appears. That doesn't happen in this call. This is a very different experience. And I thought about it, and I thought this is a lot more of what my experience has been in terms of you have to make decisions at every turn. You have to try and figure things out. Uh, you can't just go, well, God gave me a message, this is it, boom. It's, uh, I wonder what the next step is. And, and the, the open-endedness of this uh, is stunning to me. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Nehemiah and primarily chapter 2, but we'll ramp up in chapter 1. Um, and, and I've preached from this uh, passage before, so um, I don't want to be redundant or repeat myself, either one. So, uh, but Nehemiah was uh, living in exile. The people of Israel have been exiled. He was living in what uh, modern-day Iran and um, was working uh, <laughs> the job. He was the cupbearer of the king, which meant that he was the one who tasted the wine for poison. Which people have told me, you know, he was probably one of the most important people on the payroll because he was the last one to taste the wine before the king. And I thought, yes, but he's also the most expendable person in the country. The first one to go, basically. And there's probably a long line of people behind him waiting to, for that job. Um, but uh, he, he gets a visit from his brother. And uh, the brother comes and he asks, you know, what's the news back home? And the news is the people are brokenhearted. The city is in shambles. The walls have been burned down. They're defenseless. Uh, they're... Uh, their morale is depleted. Basically, life as they knew it is over. The remnant that's back in, during this exile. And when he hears this, uh, he just weeps, tells us in chapter one. He just weeps. He, he can't believe the pain and the uh, the terrible conditions and uh, what's left of his home. And um, I thought about this. I thought, you know, one of the ways that God calls us, we may not feel all that called at the time, is that when we notice a knee, when we see a knee, when we get confronted with a, with a situation and it touches us and it breaks our heart, that's one way that God gets our attention. It's not always through this big word of uh, mission or uh, uh, it's not even our giftedness or anything like it. It's just, this breaks my heart. Oh, maybe God can use you in this. Now, the interesting thing was that uh, uh, Nehemiah doesn't come up with a plan. What he does is, uh, after he's done weeping and everything, he starts praying and basically he says, Lord, you're great. Lord, we know and you've called and you've said you'd you know, take care of us or anything. When are you going to do what you said you'd do? That's basically his prayer. When are you going to act, Lord, the, the way you said you would? Which is an interesting uh, challenge to throw at God. And God doesn't respond by saying, who are you to ask me or anything like that? He doesn't even say, well, why don't you get off your duff and do something? Uh, you know, which was probably what I'd say to him. But um, he just ends the prayer and um, goes to work. Goes into work. Back to the office. Now, that's how chapter 2 opens. So... Um, 
In the 20th year of King uh, Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I would not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not sick? This has nothing to do, th this can be nothing but sadness of the heart, or depression. I was afraid. But I said to the king, King, live forever. I'm not going to kill you here. Why, why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to be? And then the king asked him what may be the most important question uh, that we could ever ask someone. And it's a question that Jesus asked several times in his ministry to different people. The king asked him, what do you want? Isn't that great? What do you want? Didn't presume it, didn't try and cheer him up, didn't say, well, you know, if you're gonna be a depressive, I don't want you suicidal and drinking my wine. I, you know, that's dangerous to me. He didn't do anything like that. He just asked him, what do you want? And I realized that may be one of the most significant questions that, that we can even ask ourselves. If we're wondering what God wants to do with us, what his call is in our life, uh, how he wants us to live, what he wants us to be involved in, maybe we need to hear that question. What do you want? <clears throat> it's not that easy to answer, is it? Um, and it's interesting because Nehemiah, when asked that question, he wasn't prepared for it. So, so uh, the king said to me, what is it you want? So I prayed to God in heaven. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I better start praying again. And then he says, if it pleases the king, I'd like some time off. That's what he asked for. I want time. Now, how does God get our attention? How does God speak his word into our lives? How does God uh, mobilize us in, in mission and ministry? Maybe it's tuning in and helping us tune in to the desires of our heart. That God actually cares about what you want. Um, you know, I grew up thinking that, that you know, you could pray about needs. That was okay. Uh, particularly, you could pray about other people's needs. Well, Lord, they need this. Could you take care of that, Lord? Because they were, and Lord, they really need you to do this. And even our own needs, Lord, you know, I need this. But was it ever okay to, to express our wants to the Lord? To bring those? That was considered kind of selfish. That was considered... Uh, shallow and superficial and yet it's the question Jesus asked over and over again what do you want me to do for you what do you want it's what King Artaxerxes asked Nehemiah what do you want without presupposing any answers that led to this most amazing, and, and during the week you can read this, uh, it's the most amazing dialogue where, where uh, Nehemiah, said, and it's kind of funny really, because Nehemiah prays, oh, Lord, what do I want? I don't know. Okay, I want time. I want some time off to go back and, and rebuild the city. Okay. So he says that. And then it began this really bizarre thing where he, he never really asked for anything, but the king just kept piling it up. You want time to go? How much time do you need? You want a week, you want a month, you want a year, you want a couple of years, and they work that out. And then, you know, King, if I'm going to go over there and rebuild the city, I'm going to need supplies. I need to have a house there. Oh, you're going to be gone a long time. Okay, well, here's some supplies for your house. Well, what are we going to do to build the city with? Well, I could give you my forests and, and the lumber, and we'll provide all the lumber for you. Well, yeah, but if I'm taking that to Jerusalem, he says, then, then I might get robbed or uh, everything might get stolen. I won't be able to use it. Oh, well, then I'll give you letters of authority from me, the king of Persia, saying that you have the right to travel safely all the way to, to Jerusalem. And this goes on and on. And then he goes, uh, without even being asked, the king throws in at the end, like an army to travel with him for safety and to help with the building. 
So all of a sudden he walks out. He didn't know what he wanted at the beginning. And all of a sudden he walks out with time and authority and all the supplies he needs, the king's forest, and an army to accompany him and carry everything and do the work with it. Unbelievable. And that's where I would end the Bible. Right there. It's so great. Fairy tale, complete. It's perfect, right? Yes, another lesson. If you go in and ask for that this is from your boss, this is what's going to happen, right? Now the, the adventure begins, okay? So he gets to Jerusalem. Now we're in chapter 2, uh, verse 11. And you'd think, now you have a, a king's army from Persia. You have the forest cut into two by fours, ready to go. You've got all this, you have letters of authority, you have everything you need, and you march into Jerusalem. This would be a really good time to be a hero, wouldn't it? To be heroic, to go, aha, I'm here, you know. Look what I can do for you. He doesn't do that. Verse 11, I went into Jerusalem, stayed there for three days. I set out during the night with a few men. I hadn't told anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no horses with me except the one I was riding on. And by night I went out through the valley gate towards the jackal well, the dung gate, well, I don't want to go there, uh, examining the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and the gates destroyed with fire. I moved towards the fountain gate of the king's pool. He went through the whole thing. The officials did not know where I'd gone, what I was doing, because I had yet said nothing to the Jews, to the priests, to the nobles, to the officials, or to any others. Then, after this quiet nighttime, uh, surveying the problem, getting a sense of what's going on, with no hoopla, promising nothing, just becoming familiar with it, he calls the people together, and, this is, and then he says this. You see the trouble that we are in. Now, to me, this is like the key to uh, effective leadership. This is the key to building strong people. He's not coming in and saying... <laughs> I see this mess here. What's wrong with you people? Why aren't you doing something about this? He doesn't do that. He doesn't even come in and say, well, what we need to do here, you know, let's fix that dung gate, first of all. I don't, and uh, he doesn't do any of that. He, he honors the people by saying, you see the problem. You're aware of it. I don't have to come in here and tell you what's wrong. You see it, and it's our problem. You see our problem. Come, let us rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and we'll no longer be in disgrace. We will no longer be in disgrace. And then I told them about the gracious hand of my God and what the king had said to me. This is the essence of how we, how we witness, isn't it? We see the problem. We're in it. We're part of it. It's shared. And then we share what God's done. And how God has led up to this point. And we remind each other that God's in this with us, right? And then we say, look at the resources. My gosh, the king of Persia is providing all of this. He's not even one of us. We were in exile, and he's providing this for us. Come on, let's do this. Now, at no time in this, did we hear God said to Nehemiah, get up, go and rebuild the city and I will provide these things for you. That didn't happen as far as we know from scripture. It was one step at a time, quietly <clears throat> moving along until he comes and he shares with the people. And, then, and when you share this, this is the weird thing, okay? Um, if you share what can happen, 
and how God's worked in the past, how he's working right now, how he's working in our lives. If you share the resource and, and, and you let that know and you say, come on, let's do this. I wish that the answer is always, yeah, let's go do it. Would that be great? I can't tell you how many times as a pastor over the years I've gone, come on, let's do this, and, and waited for the crowds to go, yeah, we're with you. <laughs> and, and the funny thing is, often there are those who do say yes. Yeah, there are. And some of you have been those people. But that's not always the answer. But the people, for the most part, said Okay, we may not rebuild the city. We may not fix everything, but let's start. That's the response they gave. We'll start. Which is kind of like a parent saying to the kid, we'll see. <laughs> you know, it's not saying no, but it's not embracing all. It's just saying, okay, you're telling us how God's involved. You tell us about the resources. We're all in this together. We, we obviously see the need. Let's start. Let's see what happens. And that was good enough. See, that's the whole point. It's good enough to just say, let's start. Now, one of the things I love about the Bible, you know, is that it's true. And so because it's true, it never leaves us with uh, the um, cheering throng saying, yeah, we're going to rebuild the city. So the very next verse, they replied, let's start rebuilding. So they began the good work. But, I love that, say the most powerful word in all of scripture. But when Sam Ballot, Tobiah, and Geshem heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is it you're doing? Are you kidding me? And that's also a usual answer. I don't think there's ever been a ministry I've been involved in that there aren't Sambalas and, and these three guys. I don't know, they change their faces, they change their names, but there's always these three guys going, what in the world? This is crazy. Who are you to do this, right? And, uh, and so the Bible's very realistic. And they're going, this is terrible. And the funny thing is, if, if you read through Nehemiah, which I encourage you to do, they keep coming up. All over, these three guys, all over. It's like, uh, they were relentless. And, and, they're, and they're just so stunned and horrified that the work is continuing. And why would these feeble people, and why, what kind of leader is this? The guy's just a poison drinker, you know, from out of town. Why, why are they doing this? And, and they can't imagine it going on. And, they, and instead of saying, oh, we were wrong, let's get on board, which I always think people will do. Hmm. They never get on board. They only get more entrenched in their resistance. They get more angry. And they move from mocking to raging to, to outright fighting them. And, and, and I always had this thing of, you know, people are good hearted and you know, when they see what's happening, they'll get on board and they'll want to be. No, isn't that shocking? Is it just me? The, there's the mocker, they, they will fight you to the death and beyond. I wonder who's going to be dancing on my grave, you know, but there'll be three Sambalots, you know. And then, uh, the, but the, the funny thing is, it's so realistic because here you have what began with just hearing some news from home from his brother. That's how simple it was. Let me tell you what's happening back home and being touched, and it, and it breaks his heart. And, and he just weeps for, for his home. And what's, what's, what's happened? And the lack of morale in the people, the discouragement. Doesn't know what to do about it, takes it to the Lord, said, Lord, it's your problem, you know, trusting you with that. Goes to work, and then this amazing provision from the king, who just wants to know what do you want. Now, if we were to look at this in our own lives, we've all got gates that are burned down in our lives. 
we've all got areas of decay, decay and, uh, and we all have areas where the world around us, the needs are so great that you go, what could be done? Nothing can be done. It's so great. I don't know what God's going to do, but it's going to take an army. Oh, wait, why don't we give you an army? It'll, it'll take a forest of, oh, well, we could give you the forest. I believe that God doesn't call us to do anything that he doesn't provide what's needed to accomplish it. That took me a long time to figure out because, you know, I'm such a positive person. <laughs> uh, you know, I always go, well, yeah, God wants that to happen, but, you know, someday because there's obviously there's no way that can happen. And then God goes, you know, if I'm going to call you to do it, I'm going to give you the provision to, to do it. I don't set you up for failure. God never sets us up for failure. But I think most of us stop and miss the call that God has in our life. We miss the adventure because we don't know how to answer the question, what do you want? It comes back to that. What do you want? How would you answer that? If we would seriously take time in our own prayer, in our own journaling, take a piece of paper this week and just write across the top the question that King Artaxerxes asked Nehemiah. Put your name, comma, and then what do you want? And then begin to write that. And then let's see what God can do with that. I don't think that God's calling all of us to go tackle the same problems. Because he's put us in different situations. We have different life experiences. We have, we have different pains. We have different gates that are broken down. And if you were to go on in this chapter, one of those strategy, brilliant strategies that Nehemiah came up with is everybody fix the wall in front of your house. That's where you start. Fix that wall right there in front of your house. Just there. We've got the wood. We've got people to help us. But why don't you, if you fix the wall in front of your house, pretty soon we're going to have this place taken care of. Right? So where has God placed you? In your work, in your neighborhood, in your family, in your situations, in your experiences, in your, in your pains, in your frustrations, in your success. Whatever it is, where has he put you? And say, okay, what can we do here? What do you want to have happen there? I think that that would transform me if I did that. So now I'm up here thinking, am I going to do the same homework assignment I just gave you? Or do I wait and see what you wrote and then talk to you about it? Or do I have to do Should we vote? Do I have to do that? Yeah. Somehow I knew Pretty much. <laughs> Susie got it right. Pretty much, John, yeah. Because you know the problems that we have. It's all shared in it. So if God's calling us, he's calling us where we are, seeking out what we want, and then calling us to work right in front of our house. I've been thinking about uh, what goes on in church. I, I've got this great book that I love so much, you know, Building Strong People, How to Lead Effectively by John Westfall and Bobby Reed. <laughs> this, but, um, this is an old book. But um, I was looking at it. It says there's a great deal of confusion among church leaders about their roles. There's often a belief that they're expected to be managers, to be efficient, effective, and resourceful in managing God's resources as administered by the local church. Certainly, there is a need for management some of the time, but all too often we step in and try and help God do it better, never realizing or knowing the damage we cause in the lives of others. 
We have taken care of people and done it for them so long that we've created <coughs> congregations of people who are passive, dependent, uninspired, inhibited, and uncreative. Is it our job to build strong ministry or is it to build strong people who minister? We believe if we build strong people who minister, the ministries will be strong. But if we strive to build strong ministries, we may end up not building strong people at all. Whoa, who's on to something? <laughs> what does God want to do? He wants to know what you want. And then he wants to surprise you with how much can happen as he works through you. That's his word for today. Lord Jesus, Walk with us. Walk with us today, tomorrow, into the future. And Lord, give us the courage to say, I'll start. That's all. I'll start. And Lord, you can take us from there. Thank you that you don't just leave us in ruin. Amen.